All right, everyone, we're going to start with our PowerPoint and audio lecture on chapter 30, um, urinary elimination. This starts on page 1059 in your basic nursing textbook. All right, so thinking back to the urinary system, you know, we, we go over a little bit of an anatomy recap here at the beginning of these chapters. So this is just to kind of refresh your memory on what exactly is the urinary system and things like that. So um, when we're thinking about the kidneys, so the kidneys filter and they regulate, okay? That is their job. So kidneys have the following functions. Firstly, um, they filter metabolic waste. They filter toxins, excess ions, and water from the blood, and they excrete them into the urine, okay? They get rid of all of the bad stuff that we don't want building up in our blood system, and they get rid of it. Um, if the kidney functions, if the kidney function is impaired, then these substances end up reaching toxic levels in the blood, and they damage our body's system. That is why if somebody's in kidney failure, and they refuse dialysis, it won't take but a day or two for them to just die because it's very, very important, this filtering system that, that is in place. Um, so that's their first function. Second function, they help to regulate blood volume, okay? They regulate blood volume, blood pressure, electrolyte levels, and acid-base balance. We talked a little bit about that in our oxygenation chapter, the acid-base balance, which I told you gets a little complicated. The kidneys are a big system in, um, in helping that process to balance out. Um, so they selectively reabsorb water and other substances, and that's kind of how they help those levels to regulate. And then third, they are secondary functions to produce erythropoietin. Um, they secrete the, en the enzyme renin and they activate vitamin D3. That's just another function that the kidneys do, okay? Going back to anatomy. So the kidneys are retroperitoneal. So that means they're located against the posterior abdominal wall behind the peritoneum. Okay, the average kidney weighs about five ounces and it's the shape of a kidney bean. So that's the kidney. A nephron, if you remember, this is the basic structural and functional unit of the kidney and it forms urine, that is its job. Each little nephron contains a Bowman's capsule. So the Bowman's capsule, that's a double walled hollow type capsule. It encloses the glomerulus, which is a little ball of capillaries, okay? Um, Inside a nephron also is a series of filtrating tubules that help with the filtration process and a collecting duct, which collects that, that urine, okay? So we got the kidneys, we got the nephron. Moving on, we've got the ureters. If you remember the ureters, okay? So each kidney has two ureters that transport urine from the kidney, that renal pelvis of the kidney, to the urinary bladder, okay? And then the urinary bladder is where it is stored. That's the reservoir, okay? It's a sac-like organ that receives urine from the ureters and holds it there until it's discharged from the body. And then lastly, the urethra. So the urethra, this transports urine from the, from the bladder to the exterior of the body. So to your toilet or to your bed or whatever you decide to pee on, okay? The mucous membrane of that urethra in both men and women is continuous with the bladder and the ure ure ureters, okay? So therefore infection of the urethra can very easily spread throughout the bladder and then up to the kidneys, okay? So that's kind of an overview of how that works. So urinary elimination, this is imp an important process to be aware of. So um, urinary elimination, also known as voiding, we can call it voiding in healthcare. Some people call it micturition. That's also voiding or peeing or whatever, urinating, all the same thing, okay? Um, so voiding occurs when a contraction of the detrusor muscle pushes the stored urine through the relaxed internal urethral sphincter into the urethra, okay? This triggers the conscious urge for a patient to void, a person to void, right? However, voiding may be voluntary, voluntarily delayed by inhibiting that release of a second external urethra sphincter as well. That's why we can control when we do or do not pee, okay? Um, when the person is ready to urinate, the brain signals to that external sphincter to relax and the urine flows through their urethra. 
Um, further contraction of that detrusor muscle normally forces out any urine remaining in the bladder. So after that detrusor muscle relaxes, the bladder becomes um, full with urine again over time. Okay. So um, your bladder can hold 200 to 450 mils of urine. Um, there can be more than that, but that's about when you start to get that horrible pain. And um, that's when we start worrying about problems with urinary retention with our patients and things like that, okay? So normal urination patterns. So the kidneys produce about 50 to 60 mils of urine per hour, okay? Um, increased fluid intake is going to increase urinary output. Normal urination occurs approximately five to eight times per day. Um, more can be a sign or symptoms of diabetes or a UTI and less often can indicate dehydration, okay? So the, which we'll learn in a little bit in the next slide, but I wanna make it abundantly clear something that you must remember about the urinary system and urinary output, okay? Um, I just said the kidneys produce 50 to 60 mils of urine per hour, okay? That's the normal, that's, that's the average. Your patient and any person should produce or should have at least 30 mils of urine per hour. So when we're counting urinary output, if we're noticing that is less than 30 per hour, that is a problem. Okay. So that 30 is the magic number and you need to know that. Okay. All right. So characteristics of normal urine. So um, when you, if you've ever had a UA or a urinalysis, these are kind of the things that they're looking for in a urinalysis to determine if there's any issues going on. So color. Normal urine should be pale yellow to a light amber in color, okay? We know that the darker the urine, typically the more concentrated and typically we're looking at dehydration. Um, the lighter the urine, the less concentrated and typically uh, they're very well hydrated. Um, the amount, like I said, at least 30 mils per hour, that is in red and I've said it multiple times. So you need to know that and that will follow you through nursing school. That is that is something that should be a glowing red flag to you when caring for a patient, whether they're post-op or just having trouble in general. Less than 30 mils per hour in urine is a signal that something in the urinary system is not working correctly and the physician needs to know about that. So the clarity, this just means, is it clear? Is it cloudy? Okay. The odor, um, there should be a non-offensive and light odor. We all know what urine smells like. It should not be super strong and poignant. That just means that they are not well hydrated or maybe that there's an infection or something like that. So it should just be a non-offensive light urinary smell, okay? Um, there should not be any protein. There should be no glucose. There should be no ketones. There should be no blood. Um, all of those things signal different problems that you will learn about throughout this program. Um, but you need to know now that there shouldn't be any of that in a normal urine specimen. Um, and then specific gravity. So specific gravity is a measure of dissolved solutes in a solution, okay? So when we talk about is the urine concentrated or is it dilute, one or the other, this is kind of a test that they're gonna do to test, to test that, okay? So as the concentration of the urine solutes increase, the specific gravity increases as well. As the concentration of the solutes decrease, the specific gravity decreases as well. So that gets a little bit confusing, but the higher the number, so the, the normal specific gravity is 1.002 to 1.003. So the higher that number gets, the more concentrated the urine, which means the more dehydrated the patient. Okay, just think of it like that. So once it gets to 1.0, five, eight, we know it's more concentrated. So you just kind of need to know that as well. So lifespan considerations with the urinary system. So with infants, um, a normal specific gravity in an infant is 0 0.008. And that's because these kiddos cannot concentrate urine. Okay. No voluntary control avoiding in these little babies, um, due to an immature neuromuscular functioning right? So they typically have 15 to 60 milliliters per kilogram that they weigh in urinary output. That is the average. 
Okay. We typically don't measure output on an infant. We tell moms and dads they need to have eight to 10 wet diapers a day. Um, and like I said, they have no voluntary control. So moving into children, um, children are dealing with their own issues with their urinary system, like toilet training. Okay. So toilet training, the timing of toilet training is highly variable and is influenced by family and culture. So maybe the presence of older children who can act as role models, things like that are going to influence young children and how, and when they decide that they're ready to toilet train. Um, in the United States, most parents begin toilet training when they're child's between 18 and 36 months of age, um, but this timing can vary widely. So before toilet training can occur, toddlers must be able to control that external urethral sphincter. They must be able to sense the urge to void, and they must be able to communicate their need to use the toilet and remove their clothing, right? These are all necessary things in order to be able to urinate on your own in the toilet. Um, toddlers usually stay dry in the daytime before they can go without a diaper all night. That's, that would be normal. Okay. Um, different problems that you can, you can see in this age group include enuresis. So enuresis is entirely normal in children, even in the early school years, especially when a child is intensely involved in a game, a test, or some kind of absorbing activity. So that just means they're peeing their pants, right? In your recess, they can't hold it. They, they go where there's not a toilet. Nocturnal in your recess. This is known as nighttime bedwetting. So this occurs in 15 to 25% of five-year-old children. By the age of 12, 8% of boys and 4% of girls still wet the bed. Okay, so that can be normal. Um, you can break that down um, further into primary nocturnal enuresis, which is bedwetting in a child who has not achieved who has not achieved consistent dryness at night before, or secondary enuresis. So this would occur in a child who has had at least six months of nighttime dryness, and then they've started suddenly wetting the bed again. That would be secondary. Okay. And then moving on to older adults, so. Older adults tend to have decreased kidney function. So renal blood flow progressively decreases with aging, um, primarily because of the changes to those micro blood vessels in the kidney. This decline in the glomerular filtration is the most important functional deficit caused by aging. Okay, so that causes the decreased kidney function. Um, the potential volume of the bladder decreases because of the loss of elasticity in the bladder wall. Okay. Therefore, older adults need to urinate more frequently, especially during the night. Um, and then the loss of elasticity and muscle tone also decreases the ability of the bladder to empty completely. So that's what I'm talking about when I say urinary retention. So retention of urine after voiding then increases the risk for bladder infection. So that just means they go, they feel like they have to pee, they pee, and then they don't get it all out. So some of that still stays in that bladder. And like I told you, anytime you're thinking about stagnant water or liquid or any type of of thing like that, you should be thinking about bacterial growth because that is where it's going to grow. And that includes in the bladder. All right, factors affecting urinary elimination. So multiple different kinds of factors. We're gonna go through these one by one. So personal factors, anxiety, <clears throat> lack of time, lack of privacy, and a loss of dignity. These can all affect the ability to urinate. That's why it's important for you to always offer privacy when you're letting your patient go to the bathroom, whether it's you're taking them to the actual toilet or whether it's you're putting them on the bedpan, you make sure they're safe, you hand them their call light, you make sure their bed is low, and then you leave the room and tell them to call when they're ready to get off, okay? That's super important because these, these factors can affect their elimination patterns. Um, Sociocultural patterns. Uh, or can affect patterns. So some patients will state personal, cultural, or religious requirements before toileting assistance. Um, maybe they want to be toileted by a person of the same gender, or maybe they'll wait before or after a visit from a family member um, before they need to acknowledge their, their help with voiding. So things like that can definitely affect that. Um, nutrition, so substances that contain caffeine, this is an important one. So coffee, tea, cola, chocolate, all of these kind of things act as diuretics and can increase urine production, 
Okay, anything with caffeine is going to increase urine production. So consuming large amounts of alcohol as well impairs that release of the ADH or yeah, the ADH, the antidiuretic hormone that results in increased production of urine as well. So coffee, tea, cola, chocolate, alcohol, right? All of these things are going to increase urine production. Um, and then in contrast, a diet that's high in salt or sodium is going to cause water retention. Okay. Water follows sodium. So the sodium's in the body, the water is going to retain in the body and that's going to decrease the urine production. Okay. So high levels of salt, that's how people get swelling and things like that. Um, hydration, this goes along with, um, um, factors affecting urinary elimination. So the kidneys also spare water when a person is dehydrated. So such as heavy exercise or when fluid intake is inadequate, this causes the urine to become concentrated and low in volume. So during prolonged periods of physical activity, especially in hot weather, the body loses sodium and other electrolytes very rapidly through sweat. So for this reason, electrolyte replacement beverages may be beneficial, um, maybe even more beneficial than water in those situations in helping prevent dehydration during prolonged activity. But hydration in general, drinking enough water throughout the day is super, super important. Um, medications as well. There's great info in your book on page 1063 and then in box 30-1 on page 1064 that you should review. Um, so diuretics, these are different, these are all different kinds of medications that you guys will learn about in farm, but this is a brief overview here. So diuretics, these are sometimes called water pills. They're typically used to treat blood pressure, fluid retention, and edema by increasing the elimination of urine. In contrast, excuse me, um, they inhibit, they inhibit the free flow of urine due to anticholinergic effects, um, these different kinds of medications. So um, there's different kinds of medications given for, uh, for instance, bladder spasms, things like that. So that would be an anticholinergic medication, okay? Um, not the diuretics. The diuretics makes them pee. Anticholinergic medications are going to make them not pee, okay? Still, other medications that are on the market are nephrotoxic, so they could be damaging to the kidneys. These include some different kinds of antibiotics, such as gentamicin um, and amphocytarin B, if you've ever heard of that. Those, some of those are antifungal medications, and they're very, very hard on the kidneys. High doses or long-term use of aspirin and ibuprofen can also be damaging to the kidneys. And then surgery and anesthesia. So back when I told you about the no normal urinary output, about 30 mils per hour, um, and I mentioned post-op surgical patients. So surgery, you should always be thinking of a post-op surgery patient, always be thinking about the urinary system and monitoring its function. Same thing with the GI system and surgery as well, which we'll get into that in another chapter. But um, surgery can just have all kinds of effects on patients and they need frequent monitoring of their body systems to make sure that they come back the way that they should. So surgery can have various effects on the urinary tract. Anesthetic agents given during surgery can decrease the blood pressure. Any decrease in blood pressure means that there is not enough blood flow getting to the kidneys. And if there's not enough blood flow getting to the kidneys, they are not filtrating the way that they are supposed to. Okay. So that's a problem. That's why blood pressure is so important to the kidneys. Okay. Um, so with anesthetic agents decreasing that blood pressure, that also decreases the glomerular filtration and can decrease urine formation. Okay. Especially spinal anesthesia. That can be a big one. Uh, so pathological factors affecting urinary elimination. So um, disorders of the urinary system that affect urinary elimination include infections or inflammation of the bladder, ureters, or the kidney, um, renal calculi or kidney stones or tumors, which could obstruct the normal blood flow of urine and older men. Um, also, there would be um, in older men, you will see hypertrophy or big, remember hyper is above, so big um, of the prostate gland. So hypertrophy of the prostate gland just means that their prostate gland is large, too large. 
Okay. So when you see that in older men, um, this can be caused by, uh, it can be benign or it can be caused by cancerous lesions as well. But because that prostate is so big in these men, it interferes with the flow of urine from the bladder into the urethra. So these, these men have trouble getting their urine out. Okay. Um, other, other pathological problems. So cardiovascular and metabolic disorders. So decrease in blood flow through those glomeruli and that can impair the filtration and urine production. Like I talked about. So cardiovascular problems, if there's any kind of decrease in blood flow to the kidneys, it's going to impair that filtration. Also nervous system disorders, any condition that affects the nervous system. Um, is going to, the nervous system control of the urinary organs will impair urinary elimination. So a stroke or spinal cord injury, for example, these patients may lose bladder control um, and not be able to tell when they need to void. They become incontinent, which just means that they, they can't tell when they have to go. So they just go whenever. Okay. Um, immobility and impaired communication. This is a big one. So um, this may interfere with the ability to get to the bathroom in time or to communicate the need for assistance. Okay. Um, mobility problems. If they can't walk on their own or get to the bathroom on their own and they have to wait for someone to help, then obviously it may get so bad that they just have to go or something like that. Um, same with impaired communication. If you have a patient who can't speak because maybe they've been, they have a deficit from a stroke. If they can't communicate that, then that's a problem because how are we supposed to know? Um, and then cognitive changes. So these changes alter the perception of the urge to void or their severe psychiatric conditions involving altered perception or ability to manage activities of daily living. This may lead to incontinence. Okay. Again, incontinence means the involuntary loss of urine. Okay. So moving to our nursing process. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is our assessment. So to assess for a urinary elimination, we're going to use the data from the nursing history. We're going to do our physical examination. We're going to use diagnostic and laboratory reports that we may have. And then we're going to paint a picture of our patient during our assessment, okay? So many diagnostic procedures of the urinary tract are performed in the operating room, maybe a procedure suite or radiology department. Um, typically nurses would prepare the client for the procedure, assist with specimen collection, deliver any care afterwards, and sometimes assist the physician during that, during that um, part. Um, so when we're talking about a physical examination, when we're talking about assessing the urinary system, there's not a ton that we can really do with that, but we can palpate or touch the, the area where the bladder is and see if it's distended. If it's just, you shouldn't be able to feel it in a normal patient. So if you feel something there and they feel like, oh, you're pressing on my bladder, it's probably distended, which means that it's full of urine. Okay. And that would be a sign. We want to, um, we want to talk to our patient about, are they having any signs and symptoms? Have, they, have they noticed any pain when they are voiding? Have they noticed frequency or urgency? That kind of thing. Um, we want to know when the last time they did pee, what's it look like? Okay. And then diagnostic procedures include a variety of things. So blood studies. So um, testing for blood urea nitrogen or BUN, that is a lab value that you guys will learn a little bit later in this, in this program, but blood urea nitrogen or BUN and creatinine levels. Those are the two, um, the two lab values, the two lab tests that are done commonly in a blood draw to assess renal function and hydration. Okay. Those two together tell you a lot about renal function. And we'll get into the normal values of those as we move through the program. Okay. Um, also visualization studies of the urinary system. So direct visualization studies tend to be invasive um, and therefore require a signed consent form, but we're talking like MRIs or CT scans or something like that. Okay. Um, or a scope, like a cystography or something like that. Um, so, and then assessing the urine, we want to assess the urine. So including, uh, uh, doing urine output or conducting some bedside tests, like a UA or something. Okay. 
when we talk about doing um, urinary output. So this is an essential component of monitoring fluid status. And we'll talk about that this week. By the time you guys watch this, you probably would have already talked a little bit about it in class. So this video here attached to your PowerPoint, I'm not going to show you in this PowerPoint, but I do encourage that you go watch it on your own. Um, this is registered nurse RN and she does a great overview of intake and output. I will likely show this to you in class. Um, so you may already have seen it, um, but it's an excellent overview. So when we're talking about measuring urinary output, this is an essential component of monitoring fluid status. It's very important. So the kidneys produce approximately 50 to 60 mils of urine per hour. So roughly 1500 mils per day. Okay. However, urinary output fluctuates depending on the following. So what quantity of fluids are, is the patient drinking? The ability of the heart to circulate blood, the actual kidney function, the ability of the patient to void into, um, to, to actually void the urine, the amount of the fluid being excreted, like excessive sweating or significant vomiting or significant diarrhea and a high fever can also contribute to reduced, um, urine output as well. So when we're talking about measuring intake and output, this is going to be a very brief overview because we're going to focus on this in our math section um, this week. So uh, when we're measuring intake and output, we're going to record all the fluids that the patient drinks or receives orally or intravenously. Okay. Um, so fluid intake can include a variety of things. So oral fluids like water, juice, coffee, milk, um, semi-liquid foods like ice cream or gelatin, those count as, as fluid intake as well. Ice chips count as fluid intake. The thing with ice chips is that we make sure that whatever the volume is that we give in ice chips, we count it as liquid in half the volume because it melts to half the volume. So if you give a thousand mils of ice chips, we're going to count it as 500 mils of water. Okay. Um, IV fluids is also part of the fluid intake, as well as tube feedings and irrigations um, that are instilled, okay? So when I say that, there's something called a continuous bladder irrigation, okay? And what that is, is if, when somebody maybe has a bladder surgery of some kind, they take a large bag of fluid and they instill it into the catheter to flush out the bladder and then it drains immediately into a catheter bag, okay? Um, that's called a continuous bladder irrigation. The fluid goes directly in and it comes directly out. That installation does not count as fluid intake and it does not count as fluid output, okay? Because Think of it like a shower. We don't count that as intake or output. It goes directly in, comes directly out. So continuous bladder irrigations is not counted, okay? And then when we're talking about fluid output, we're talking about urine output. How much are they peeing? Um, what about any vomiting, any diarrhea, any fluid that comes out from drains, draining wounds, draining actual inputted drains from surgery, things like that. All of that is considered output. Um, we like to balance intake and output. What goes in should come out. So if their intake is greater than their output, then they're at risk for fluid volume overload where they have too much fluid in their body. If their output is greater than their intake, then they're at risk for fluid loss. Like fluid volume deficit would be a good nursing diagnosis to choose for those patients. So this is a very important part of nursing. Um, and these math problems get really complicated. So um, we'll work on that in class. All right, so urine diagnostic study. So you see my bubble up here. Don't forget to check out the procedures at the end of the chapter, okay? Um, these, this is just overview of specimens and studies, different kind of urinary specimens and studies. So a freshly voided specimen, this to collect a freshly voided sample, we're going to collect urine in the same manner as which you are measuring intake and output. So we pour the urine into a specimen container, label with the patient's name, the date, the time of collection. Um, and then we send it to lab. So many facilities require packaging the container in a moisture proof speci specimen handling bag. Um, so we'd follow agency policy on that. Um, the freshly voided specimen does not have to be sterile. You literally just grab it and go, okay? The downside with that is that there may be um, 
skin cells from your fingers that get into this or the patient's fingers if they're messing around in there. Um, and they, when they get that specimen, same with like different bacteria that may have been on their hands or in the cup or whatever, this is not um, as conclusive as other methods. Um, there is a clean catch. So otherwise called a clean catch midstream. Okay, so the client, when, when we say get a clean catch or a clean catch midstream, we say the client must cleanse their genitalia before peeing. So we give them like a little alcohol pad. We tell them to clean their urethra off and then they pee a little bit. And then after they pee a little bit, they stop peeing and then they put the cup up there and then they catch their midstream urine. Okay, so they clean their genitalia they pee a little bit and then they pee in the cup. So they catch it midstream, okay? And the point of that is to, there may be bacteria there at that urinary meatus. And so the point is to get rid of that bacteria. So we clean it with alcohol and then we pee a little bit out in the toilet so that the, any bacteria that was there is gone now. And then we collect that midstream urine, okay? So that gets rid of that bacterial issue there. Then there's also a sterile specimen. So the clean catch is not sterile as well. It is just more clean than that freshly voided specimen. So these are kind of listed here in order of dirtiest to cleanest, okay? So a sterile specimen can be, um, can be obtained by inserting a catheter into the bladder and withdrawing a sample from that catheter, okay? Um, we don't ever take a sterile specimen from the urinary catheter bag um, unless, unless it is ordered that way, which typically it's not. Um, you guys will learn how to take a sterile specimen from the catheter bag. However, it's not from the actual draining bag. This is gonna be way easier to explain to you in person, but um, we'll show you in lab how to obtain a sterile specimen from an already anchored Foley. What I'm saying is you will never get a sterile specimen from the actual draining catheter bag reservoir where the pee has been sitting for several hours. Because remember, stagnant liquid is going to cause bacterial growth, okay? So there's a clamp on that catheter. I'll show you how to clamp that so that urine builds up and we get that freshly voided urine so that it's free of those contaminants. So that would be a sterile specimen. Um, other kinds of studies, I, I don't see this on your slide, but I'm going to tell you about a 24 hour urine. So you do need to know about this. So with a 24 hour urine, they typically order this for patients where maybe they had some protein in their, um, urine sample. And we know that that's not normal. So we want to see, they may be spilling a little bit of protein right now that I see in this small sample, but what are they doing over the period of a day? So then they order a 24 hour urine. So with this, you must use a large container and preserve, preserve all of the urine that's voided in a 24 hour time period. Okay, occasionally you'll be asked to store each voiding in a separate container, but that's not normal. I've never seen that. Um, so to begin collecting, that's important to know, you have to have the patient void in the toilet and then you record the time. You get rid of that first voiding. And then from that time on, you save every single um, urine specimen from that time, they void into this large container for the next 24 hours. Um, be sure to inform the patient and all the staff about the collection, post signs in prominent locations, because we don't want anybody to discard the urine because then it's not an accurate measurement. So that's your 24 hour urine. Um, a urinalysis. So this includes dipstick testing, which you can see in this picture to the right of your screen. Um, it's commonly performed at the bedside. Sometimes they make you send it down to lab. It just depends. We talked a little bit about this at the beginning. Um, so it determines the pH of the urine, can determine the specific gravity, the presence of protein, glucose, ketones, and blood, things like that. Um, and then well, dipstick testing, very similar. And then a specific gravity, like we talked about, you can get that information from the dipstick or the urinalysis as well. Okay, so moving on to the second step of our nursing process, so diagnoses. This again is just a list of the approved diagnoses that you may see for uh, patients with urinary issues, okay? Um, again, you can find these in your uh, nursing diagnoses book as well. Um, but these are ones that could be um, appropriate for a patient with urinary problems. 
So planning our outcomes. These are all, we know that this is specific to what is happening with their kidney function, their continence, their elimination, their tissue integrity, things like that. Um, so that's all, all of these general, these goals are going to be patient specific, but the general goal for urinary elimination is that patients will comfortably void approximately 1500 mils of light yellow urine in 24 hours. Okay. That would be a very general outcome or a general goal. So let's test our knowledge. So your patient seeks healthcare for pain in her lower back and a fever with chills. She also reports experiencing a strong persistent urge to urinate and burning with pain when she urinates. You collect a clean catch specimen for culture and you note a strong odor and a cloudy appearance. Urine dipstick is positive for RBCs or red blood cells, leukocytes, which are WBCs or white blood cells and bacteria. So talking through this, what does the nurse know about how a kidney function develops from a urinary tract infection? What does the nurse do to manage the symptoms? And what, in what ways could the nurse show caring? Okay. Um, so when we're thinking through this, um, and again, you can pause this if you need to. Um, but when we're thinking through this, so an infection that starts in the lower urinary tract can ascend up to the ureters, to the kidney structures. Okay. It comes from the outside world, can go up the urethra, up the ureters, up to the kidney, call it up to the bladder, cause problems. Okay. Bacteria found in stool, such as E. coli, um, these commonly cause UTI. So this could be patients not wiping, especially women, not wiping from front to back. Okay, we need to educate them. You've got to wipe from front to back. You wipe from back to front and you get all that bacteria in your urethra it can cause a kidney bladder infection, okay? Um, sometimes skin bacteria can, can cause problems in the urinary system. It's not very often. Um, but any conditions that create reduced urine flow. So we talked about urinary retention. Um, this can make a kidney infection more likely. When the urine flow stops, stagnant water, stagnant fluid, that's what we talked about, can breed bacteria. Um, other causes of urinary obstruction as well. So not in this patient because she's a female, but benign prostatic hypertrophy. We talked about that big prostate. Okay. So that could be a problem. Not for her, obviously, but in, in general. So, and then kidney, kidney stones, that kind of thing, any kind of, any kind of, um, thing that's going to obstruct that urine flow. Okay. And then, so what is the nurse going to do to manage the symptoms? So what are we gonna do about it? We're gonna administer antibiotics for bacterial infection. Uh, we'd advise her to take maybe, if you've ever heard of pyridium, that can cause, uh, it can get rid of bladder spasms that can help the burning and the urgency of the first couple of days. Um, Tylenol over the counter to manage symptoms. Um, and then we're gonna encourage liberal fluid intake so that we can flush out that bacteria. We're gonna advise her to avoid coffee and alcohol until the infection's cleared because we know that that can work as a diuretic and it can get rid of lots and lots of fluid when she needs the hydration. And how are we gonna show caring to this patient? What if we offered her a heating pad on her belly or her lower back to reduce those feelings of pressure or pain? And then offer extra comfort for fever, nausea, any pain, show her that we, get a, we care about her, come in frequently, things like that. So the female client states to the nurse, I am so distressed. It seems like every time I laugh hard, I wet myself. The nurse knows that this condition is known as which kind of incontinence? A, stress incontinence, B, urge incontinence, C, functional incontinence, or D, unconscious incontinence. So there are multiple different kinds of incontinences that you will find in your book and you need to know the difference, okay? You need to know the difference between them. Okay. And this will kind of help with one of them. So um, the answer here, if you know, is answer A. So stress incontinence. So a lot of times this results from increased pressure within the abdominal cavity. Um, a lot of times this happens with patients who um, have been pregnant before or have had multiple babies. They just don't have that bladder control. And sometimes urine just slips out. If you know, you know jumping on the trampoline, sneezing, laughing hard, things like that are going to cause stress and continence. All right. 
Um, so promoting normal urination. These are all things that we can do to help our patient urinate appropriately. So we're going to provide privacy. Okay, most people consider this a private matter. Um, so taking a matter of fact approach confirms to the patient that you're comfortable with this aspect of care. So provide them privacy when discussing it or providing care related to urination. Okay, like we talked about, make sure that they're safe, tell them to call when they're done and just give them that privacy, leave the room. Tell visitors to leave the room. Okay, draw the privacy curtains in the room all of those kinds of things. Um, assisting with positioning. So most men are going to stand when they void um, and they may have difficulty voiding in other positions. So whenever possible, we're gonna assist our patient to the bathroom to use the toilet and allow them to um, assume whatever position they would like. Um, when women generally find an upright seated or squatting position to be most comfortable, um, so if a female patient must remain in bed, provide a bedpan and then place her in a semi fowler's position instead of making her lay flat because it's just not normal for us, right? Um, we're going to facilitate toileting routines. Most patients void when they wake up, right? Right as soon as they wake up, typically after meals, after drinking a large volume of fluid right before bed. Um, and then during the night for some. So we're gonna identify our patient's patterns and stick to it as much as possible. If you anticipate a change in the pattern for elimination, we need to inform the patient. So when you're dealing with patients who have incontinence or you know maybe they're younger patients who have just realized they're starting to have incontinence, implementing a bladder training program would be very beneficial for these patients where they, um, they go through that process to train their bladder to hold a little bit more urine and a little bit more urine. So they kind of hold their urine for longer and longer and longer amount of time. So that's a very, very beneficial intervention. Um, we're also going to promote adequate fluids and nutrition. So adequate hydration we know is going to promote healthy urinary function and it's going to flush, flush out those waste products from the bladder and the kidneys. Uh, most people should drink eight to 10 eight ounce glasses of fluid a day unless they have some kind of health problem that must limit their fluid intake, okay? Most people don't meet this recommended fluid intake, so we want to make sure that we um, encourage our patients to do so. Water is the preferred fluid because, like we talked about, soda, coffee, and tea contain caffeine and additives that may cause diuresis or excessive pain or incontinence where they can't control that urge. Um, However, the amount of fluid that they take is more important than the type. So if they will not or cannot drink water, then provide, provide the fluid that they can and will take. Okay, that's where your critical thinking comes in. And then assisting with hygiene. So urine is a very irritating substance to the skin. That's important for you to realize. Urine is acidic, okay? So the longer a patient lays in the urine, the longer or the, the more, the worse their skin is going to look. We've all seen a diaper rash before. Okay. A lot of times that's, that's the culprit is their acidic urine. Okay. Um, so frequent perineal cleansing is an essential part of toileting hygiene. Okay. Pouring warm soapy water over the genitals while the patient's seated on the toilet, um, or the bedpan, making sure that you rinse with warm water, um, making sure that you clean before and after, um, they go and things like that, okay? Those are important. We wanna get that pee off the skin. Um, alterations in urinary elimination. So urinary tract infections, these can occur when microorganisms like E. coli, which normally lives harmlessly in the colon, um, but when that, that enters the urethra and begins to multiply, it can cause over overwhelming results of a urinary tract infection. Um, cystitis, that's another one that can cause, um, cause problems. So this is when bacteria travels up the urethra into the bladder, causing a bladder infection. So when you see the, the prefix cyst, itis, cyst is typically meaning bladder. So like a cystography, that is like a test to where you go in and see the bladder from like a scope. Um, if not treated promptly, these kind of infections may progress upwards to the ureters or the kidneys and then eventually get septic. That's just how infections work. So it's important to pay attention to the signs. Um, urinary retention. So this is, again, the inability to empty the bladder completely. So 
Again, these can be caused by obstructions or inflammation or swelling, neurological problems, different medications and anxiety as well. So we want to keep an eye out for that. Um, urinary incontinence. So this is a lack of voluntary control over urination. Okay, urinary incontinence will affect about two thirds of older adults to at least some degree. Um, it's associated with skin impairment. That's important for you to know, right? Because urine acidic ruins the skin. Okay, that's so important. Um, it can be associated with obesity, UTIs, um, poor health, reduced mobility, depression, all of these things. Okay, um, and it can lead to social isolation and increased caregiver burden right? Um, and then urinary diversions and urostomies. So this is a surgically created opening for elimination of urine. Okay. Kind of like in the oxygenation chapter, we talked about the surgically created opening for the airway, which is a tracheostomy. This one's called a urostomy. Okay. And this one is just a surgically created opening right into, um, right into the reservoir can be right into the bladder. Um, to bypass that, they have some kind of issue, maybe a tumor or something in there that is causing problems. So um, they're typically used to treat patients who have conditions like birth defects or cancer or trauma um, or some kind of disease of the urinary system, okay? Um, a patient with a urinary diversion does not eliminate urine via the urethra, but instead it bypasses the bladder and is expelled through a stoma, Okay. And we'll kind of show you stomas when we get into lab and when we start talking about colostomies and, and um, things like that in the GI chapter. Um, getting into types of urinary incontinence. So page 1081. So you need to know these different kinds of incontinence. Okay. So we've got urge incontinence. So this is involuntary loss of urine with a strong urge to void. So they feel like they have to put, they feel like they have to go and then they just go. Okay. So it's an overactive bladder. Maybe their bladder can't hold, um, as much urine as it once could. So they feel like they have to go all the time. Um, again, the, these kinds of patients in particular, urge incontinence patients would do re really well with bladder training. So, um, increasing the time between voids to see if they can gent like gently increase the amount of fluid that can be held in their bladder. Um, stress incontinence. So this is the involuntary loss of urine with increased pressure as the absence of, and it is the absence of an overactive bladder. Okay. So this is that involuntary loss of urine with increased pressure. So we talk about sneezing, coughing, laughing. Okay. Um, jumping around all of those things. This is typically caused by pregnancy or previous pregnancies. Um, unconscious incontinence. So this is the loss of urine when the person doesn't realize that the bladder is full and has had no urge to void. You see this in central nervous system disorders. Okay. And then overflow incontinence. This is the leakage of urine when there is a distended bladder. So these, these patients may have an enlarged prostate, like we talked about, um, or even a fecal impaction. You'll, you'll realize throughout your career that even having, um, being super constipated or being very backed up with stool can actually put pressure on the bladder and cause urine to not come out like it should, which is why a lot of times um, they'll do a KUB, a kidney urea bladder scan, if you've ever, your reader bladder scan, if you've ever heard of that, when they're checking for um, uh, constipation, because you can kind of see all that and how it interacts together, okay? So managing urinary retention. So um, how are we going to get that, that urine out of there that's been in there that they can't get out, right? So urinary catheterization, that is one intervention that we could do, right? So uh, there's different kinds of catheters. So there's a straight catheter. So this is a single lumen tube that is inserted for immediate drainage of the bladder. Okay, so you're either going in there to just get some of that out real quick, or you're going to get a sterile specimen, or maybe you're trying to measure a post void residual, which means you told the patient to go pee in the toilet. And then you come back and you cath them and see how much is left. How much did they not pee out? Um, or that kind of thing. So that's a straight catheter. So after the bladder is empty and the sample is obtained, that catheter is taken out. And then the patient resumes peeing independently. So that's kind of a short term. We're going to relieve this right now. And then 
We're going to take it out and we're going to see if they can do it themselves kind of thing. So that's a straight catheter. An indwelling catheter, also known as a Foley catheter, okay, which you'll hear us say that a lot. This is used for continuous bladder drainage, okay, when the bladder must be kept empty or when continuous measurement of urine is needed or there's some kind of problem, okay? A lot of times maybe they'll even put them in when the patient has a really bad wound and they want, they don't want the pee to sit on the, that acidity on their skin to make the wound worse, so they put in a Foley catheter. Um, this is typically a double lumen tube. Um, and on that second lumen, one, human, one lumen is used to drain the urine into a reservoir bag. And that second lumen, lumen is used to inflate a balloon near the tip of the catheter. And that inflated balloon holds the catheter in place at that neck of the bladder. Okay, the balloon is sized according to how many, how many mils it can hold. Um, and you guys will learn about this because it's one of your skills in lab. So we'll check off on that. It's a sterile procedure to put it in. Um, and it's important for you to know how to do that, okay? And then there's something called a suprapubic catheter. So this is used when continuous urine drainage or the urethra must be bypassed. So maybe after some kind of gynecological surgery or when there's a prostate obstruction. So a suprapubic catheter is inserted through an incision above the symphysis pubis, and it's often sutured in place, okay? It may occasionally be a double lumen catheter held in place by a balloon, but most of the time it is sutured in place, okay? So we're talking about nursing care for a catheter. So uh, by doing urinary catheter care, it's going to prevent urinary tract infections. It's going to maintain a free flow of urine, okay, which is important. So preventing urinary tract infections. So let's talk about that real quick. So that means maintaining the hygiene of the catheter. So cleaning it with soap and water from the, from the, from where it is inserted away, because we never want to clean from away to into the urethra, because then we're pushing bacteria that way. So we start where it's inserted and we clean it from away, right? We clean it towards the away portion, okay? So um, that's important, okay? And, and making sure that we're following guidelines and facility policies on how long these are allowed to be anchored and things like that. So preventing urinary tract infections, that's important for catheter care. Maintaining the free flow of urine. So we wanna make sure that there's no kinks in the tubing. We wanna make sure there's no compression. We wanna make sure that the, the catheter bag is below the level of the bladder because it drains to gravity, okay? So if you have that catheter bag up by their head, no, no urine is going to be coming into that catheter bag because of gravity, right? And so if there's a kink in the tubing or there's some big heavy book sitting on the tubing, there's going to be no urine getting into that catheter bag. Um, and so where's the urine going? Well, it's sitting still in the bladder. And what do we think about stagnant fluid, right? Bacterial overgrowth. So we never want that to happen in their body, okay? So it's super important for if you're noticing that you've anchored this fully two or three hours ago and there's nothing in that bag, we're gonna check that tubing and make sure that it's not kinked or something. We're gonna make sure there's no obstruction. We gotta make sure and troubleshoot that so that we can make sure that there's a free flow of urine, okay? Um, catheter care also prevents transmission of infection, um, promotes normal urine production. So giving, um, giving oral hydration, IV hydration as ordered, right. And then maintaining skin and mucosal integrity. So again, making sure that, um, you know, we're cleaning after each time they have a, um, avoiding spell, but when there's a catheter in, if there's any leakage of urine around that catheter, we wanna make sure that we clean with soap and water. Um, catheter care can be delegated to your nursing assistant, okay? They can do catheter care. They can clean these, these areas. The nurse prepares to insert an indwelling urinary catheter. Which statement least correctly explains the reason for this intervention? A, to empty your bladder prior to your procedure. B, to treat your problem of leaking urine, C, to abstain a, obtain a sterile urine specimen for culture, or D, to measure the amount of urine left after em you emptied your bladder.
So let's walk through this together. So when we're breaking down this um, question, we need to find out what is it asking. So we're inserting an indwelling urinary catheter. So which statement least correctly explains the reason? So which one is not correct is what this is asking for. Do we use an indwelling catheter to empty the bladder prior to procedure? Yes or no? And that's how we can approach this question. So do we use it to empty bladder prior to procedure? Yes. Do we obtain a sterile urine specimen for culture through a urinary catheter? Yes. Do we measure the amount of urine left in the left after they've emptied their bladder? Yes. So do we treat their problem of leaking urine with an indwelling urinary catheter? Some of you may want to say yes, because that sounds a little tricky, but the answer is no. So that is the problem here. An indwelling urinary catheter is an invasive procedure that is very, very much connected to um, the initiation of an infection, okay? You pretty much know that you're taking a very big risk of giving your patient infection when you're putting in a urinary catheter. Therefore, we will not use that just as a treatment of leaking urine, okay? Incontinence is not an appropriate diagnosis to get a urinary catheter, okay? It's just not. So that's why that's the correct answer. <clears throat> so managing urinary incontinence. Um, so what's important about these patients that are having incontinent episodes? So I tell you over and over and over again, skin, skin, skin. That is a huge deal in nursing. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna prevent skin breakdown, okay? Normal urine is acidic as I've told you a million times now. When it remains in contact with the skin, it becomes alkaline and it causes dermatitis and skin excoriation. It is essential to keep the skin, clothing, and bedding clean and dry, especially after any leaking of urine. Okay, barrier creams may be used for irritated skin. Antifungals can be ordered to prevent or eliminate kind of fungus growth if you see that. Um, and you can ab use absorbent products and other means necessary to control that. But it's super important that we keep their skin clean and dry. Okay, we're gonna teach lifestyle modifications. So this involves dietary changes. Hey, you need to increase your fluid intake. You need to stop smoking. You need to avoid caffeine prevent constipation like we told like I told you about if they're super constipated it can put pressure on that bladder and cause them not to void so we want to teach them how to prevent constipation um, we want to tell them to uh, to avoid any physical activity like high impact exercise which may cause the leakage of urine right um, we want to um, um, encourage weight reduction by as little as five to 10% can alleviate a little bit of incontinence symptoms and improve the quality of life. Okay. We don't typically recommend a fluid restriction. Okay. Um, unless they have some other kind of diagnosis that requires that we don't recommend restricting fluids for incontinence. Okay. Um, and then bladder training. So the goal of bladder training is to enable that person to hold an increasingly larger volume of urine in the bladder and to increase that interval between voiding. So this involves patient teaching, scheduling voiding at certain times and self-monitoring using maybe a voiding diary, having them write down the times and how long you know they've waited. Um, in addition, we wanna teach them distraction and relaxation so they can, they can get through those times because it may be difficult in, in the beginning. Um, Kegel exercises. These are most commonly used, the most commonly used method for preventing and reversing incontinence in women for the first year after giving birth. So that's stress incontinence, right? Um, so this approach may be used to prevent or reduce incontinence in older women as well, or even men undergoing prostate surgery. Okay. Um, so it's just where you activate those pelvic floor muscles where those same muscles that you use when you try to stop yourself from voiding midstream. So that's a Kegel exercise. If you're just sitting in your chair performing those Kegel exercises, they really do help. And then, um, 
strategies that we're going to use as nurses to promote independent urination. So there may be some pharmacological interventions. So estrogen supplements may be prescribed um, in women who are postmenopausal and have incontinence secondary to vaginitis or something. Um, for urge incontinence, there may be medications used to relax that detrusor muscle. Um, like, like I talked about anticholinergic medications. Okay. There's different kinds of medications on the market for things like that. Um, again, surgical interventions. So when incontinence is caused by other issues like a cystocele or a rectocele or an enlarged prostate gland, gland, surgical techniques may be appropriate in those situations. And then maybe providing parental teaching for in uresis in children. So um, these children can be embarrassed, especially by peeing the bed or, you know, not to mention the inconvenience that it poses on kids and parents. Okay. So young children may feel anxious about going to the bathroom in a clinic or a hospital or an unfamiliar environment. They may be especially anxious about using a bedpan in a hospital setting. So we want to be aware of that and coupled with the stress of an illness or a hospitalization you may need to schedule regular trips to the bathroom and you may need to just be very gentle with them and encouraging them. Um, so testing your knowledge. So you're caring for a frail elderly woman with overflow incontinence. What physical and emotional issues would you expect her to also experience? So we're thinking about incontinence. So the overflow incontinence, remember that this is a frequent or constant dribbling of urine because the bladder does not empty completely. Okay, so problems that I um, would anticipate with this patient would be probably social isolation. So due to the odor of incontinent urine or embarrassment of the clothing being wet, they may often avoid social interactions. So with fewer social outings, this person can become lonely or sensory deprived. They might express feelings of humiliation or stigma, okay? Um, common social withdrawal may occur because of the fear of being incontinent in public. Um, also skin compromise, right? So exposure to urine and feces, if that's, if that's a thing as well for this patient, um, can be a common cause of skin breakdown. So we wanna make sure that we are um, thinking about that as well. And then dehydration. So maybe in order to prevent herself from, from having this overflow incontinence, she doesn't drink as much. Okay. So we need to educate. Um, we need to try to um, tell them that you still need to drink, even though you don't want to pee, you still have to drink. And then frequent urinary tract infection. So incontinence increases that risk of repeated UTIs. Okay. And then this is just a brief overview of urinary diversion. So when we talked a little bit about this, a urinary diversion or a urostomy, this is a surgically created opening for elimination of urine, okay? A patient with a urinary diversion does not eliminate via the urethra. Instead, it bypasses and, and goes into something called a stoma, okay? They no longer have voluntary control of urination. Um, it constantly flows through the stoma and is collected in a pouch that the patient wears. Urostomies are used to treat patients who have um, defects or trauma. Um, and there are multiple different kinds of urinary diversions that you can read about in your book. We don't need to really get into them like crazy, but there's a cutaneous ureterostomy. There's a conventional, conventional urostomy, like an ilia conduit that you can see here in this picture. Um, there's continent urinary reservoirs. And then there's a neobladder. So you guys can kind of review these kind of things in your book. You don't really need to spend much time on that part. And then we're going to test your knowledge. So there's a 24-hour urine collection and process for a client. The nursing assistant personnel inadvertently empties one specimen into the toilet instead of the collection hat. The nurse should what? A, continue with the collection of urine until the 24-hour time period is finished. B, make note to the lab and inform them that one specimen was missed during the collection. C, begin filling a new collection container and take both containers to the lab at the end of the collection period. Or D, dispose of the urine already collected and begin an entirely new 24-hour urine collection. The answer is D. Once a specimen is missed during a 24-hour urine collection, the results of the laboratory test will be inaccurate and the collection must be restarted. Okay. All right. And that concludes this one.